So, of course, I'm very delighted that uh, uh, Professor David Nakash accepted to give uh, the, the second seminar series of our AI TII seminar series. Um, David Nakash is professor at DNS Paris, which is one of the top research institutes in the France and even the world. And he's also a specialist um, of uh, um, topics related to security and cryptography. What's quite astonishing about David Nakash is that he's at the intersection, I would say, academic research, but also real hands-on experience in working in different topics with consulting companies and, uh, and, and also working with startups, but also dealing with uh, uh, institutions in matters related to cryptography and security. Um, I'm also very delighted because uh, at the moment we're also working with David Nakash, so he, we can uh, uh, benefit from his consulting services to work and more closely with the AI. So this is also a, a, an opportunity to kickstart this kind of collaboration. And I'm really happy that we can have him more uh, helping us in the work that we're doing at TII. Um, so I think I'll stop just here. Uh, beside that, of course, he's also a close friend of mine. Appreciate a lot of his wisdom and topics with a wide range of, of involvements in topics going from communication to Bitcoins uh, to cryptography, but also whatever question you can have. He's a quite uh, hectic and, 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 and open-minded uh, researchers. And, and I think uh, this is the kind of people we're looking for also at TII. So his topic uh, uh, is around federated under privacy constraints. As you all know, federated learning is becoming a huge topic. And he's going to show us why when feathered learning and cryptography meets. Thank you again, David Nakash, and the, and the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Marwan. It's a big pleasure for me to be with you today and uh, present to you uh, this research. Uh, it's actually a little research that was not really published, but it's more of a security engineering thing. And I thought it would interest everybody because it is mixing both federated learning and uh, privacy and, uh, <coughs> and using crypto as a tool. So, uh, basically, uh, if we, um, uh, we start, uh, we look at um, machine le learning versus federated learning. So for those of you who don't know what federated learning is, it is a way that allows us to distribute machine learning. So what do we do in federated learning? Instead of having one big, large centralized machine that gets the data uh, from, um, <coughs> from all the sensors, we divide uh, learning into local learnings and the different machines uh, refine the model. Now, uh, when those machines ended uh, refining their local models, the learned information is aggregated centrally. Basically, the models uh, are sent to a server who aggregates them. And in general, <coughs> each um, uh, device would both collect uh, the data and learn from it. And um, by averaging the different models, uh, we have uh, we, we managed to uh, we managed to 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 learn uh, in a way that that has some advantages, uh, which are uh, basically computational on one hand because you're using many devices to perform the learning and not only one, and also from a privacy standpoint because you are not collecting the data into the central machine but but into the local machines and usually those local machines. A trusted machines. So the, the, the typical uh, example is that of your mobile phone on which uh, you do keyboard uh, prediction that learns uh, the, 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 the words that you type so, so it can predict the next one. And you see that <clears throat> there is no harm that your machine actually knows what you type. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but, uh, but, uh, but forwarding to the cloud more uh, than the aggregated information uh, can harm because uh, because uh, you can learn uh, actual sentences uh, that you have been uh, that you have been typing. So this is what uh, uh, federated learning is. So I did here this little um, drawing. So as you can see, those those users have mobile phones, and uh, <clears throat> they all have uh, neural networks that that has the same morphology, the same structure. But what differs are actually the weights. Uh, because each of them is learning uh, independently. And then those models, uh, not the data, those models are being uploaded into a central server and the central server will send uh, to uh, the, uh, the, the different, uh, <clears throat> the different uh, nodes uh, an updated average model 
And then what would happen is that uh, they will continue refining it and little by little, they will get the model without actually betraying their data. So <clears throat> this idea was first introduced by Google in an ARCSIF paper. And, uh, and it, it basically consists in considering uh, a finite sum objective of the form that you can see here, uh, with, uh, with, uh, where, I, where I denote uh, actually uh, uh, lo by loss, uh, the, the loss of the prediction uh, on an example using the model W. So basically what you want to do, you want to minimize uh, the, uh, the, 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 the loss that you're getting by, by, by reducing the deviation between the reality and what your model predicts. And, and as you can see, uh, when you develop this uh, and you try to see uh, how you dis distribute it over K nodes, uh, when you have K, uh, uh, K, uh, K, uh, K devices that are doing the learning at the same time uh, and they're working in parallel, but with the same W, uh, you can see that you can do this averaging that you can see here, which is nk divided by n. You give the, to, to the model uh, of someone uh, the, 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 an importance which is, <coughs> which is weighted by the number of samples that he studied. So the one who brings you a lot of samples uh, will be given a lot, of in, 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 uh, a lot of importance, and the one who, who gives you less samples will weight less in the averaging. And as this new W is obtained, you distribute it and you continue learning to refine it and uh, you, uh, you, um, you iterate and iterate and iterate. And this is basically uh, what federated learning is. And I did here a very nice uh, little drawing with the ticks uh, where you can see the process. So you have a node that, that got a, a new W, a new model. He continues to refine and learn with that W. He, gets a new refined W, which is called WK. All the nodes send their, 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 uh, their models to, to the weights to the authority. The authority average them to get a new W and the circles uh, continues again. And like this, everybody benefits of at any point in time uh, of an updated model <coughs> that reflects reality as much as we can. So I was working on this area uh by trying to have uh, i would say uh ideas that that stand up ideas that are not the usual ones so for instance uh not only in security i was trying to see how i can play with this uh, federated learning so one idea for instance that um, that we explored is something to do with security is trying to see if i can improve federated learning by doing something more intelligent than the average so basically, if you take someone uh, who have been doing uh, uh, electronics or, uh, uh, or, or, or control theory, and you ask him, well, uh, what is better or what generalizes the average, uh, the person would usually tell you, OK, you can use what is called PID, the PID, the PID controller, which is uh, basically proportional integral derivative and, um, and where instead of just to, to thinking at the proportional uh, part, which is the average, uh, you also look into the derivative, uh, where is your signal going, and in the integral over a given uh, a period in time. So for instance, if I stay in this room and I want to keep the temperature to be 25 degrees, and people are opening the door, opening windows, coming in, coming out, opening the fridge, uh, turning on devices, and so on, the PID controller, what it would do is it would drive the heater in a way which is weighted between three things. The integral of the temperature over the last, let's say, five minutes, the derivative of the temperature at this moment, let's say if someone opened the window, there is a strong derivative below, so you need to compensate immediately, and also the current temperature that you have. So <clears throat> for instance, what I looked into is what happens if instead of waiting, uh, simply doing the average, uh, I can also have a, a uh, a, a component which is based on what we know already in the past, which is basically the integral of the, the, the values of our past period and the derivative. Basically, if we are learning something in absolutely important now that changes our view, view of things, shouldn't we give it more importance uh, by, by, uh, by, by learning fast? And this is something which, which has an intuition. Basically, what happens is that 
if you look into, <clears throat> into information in the Shannon sense, Shannon defines basically the information as the amount of surprise that you have in a message. So what does this mean? It means that a message carries an amount of information which is the minus of the log of the probability that you will hear me saying this message. So if I say to a message, I ate breakfast this morning, what happens is the probability that you would hear this message is quite high. So if you take the, the logarithm of a big fraction, you see what is going to happen. It's going to be rather small, but in negative. So if you invert it, you can see that this doesn't give you a lot of information. But if I tell you, when I went downstairs, all of a sudden, I met President Macron, this is something which probability is very low. So the log of this probability is something which is huge in negative. Okay, it's one over one over a million, let's say. So, so, so the log of this is very, is very, uh, is huge. And if I turn it negatively by reverting the sign, you can see that it brings a lot of information. So basically, for Shannon, the information that something carries is the amount of surprise. If you went to a, to, to a meeting or to a conference and you are not surprised, you didn't learn anything. Basically, you spent your time, you're sitting in the meeting, you lost your time. If you are surprised, it means that you learned, you learned something. So the, the, the surprise betrays the fact that you learned something, positive or negative, but you learned something. Now, what is the difference with learning? What is the problem with learning? The problem is that the more a message is surprising us, the more it contradicts our previous beliefs, the more important it is. So, so it means that this, this, this message is, is meaningful. It is, it is bringing to us something new that we didn't know before. So you see that if I just average messages, but I don't average them in a weighted way, I might slow my learning process. And slowing my learning process, I might have a model which is unfit to reality. Or David, take... there was a, just a question. I mean, we're still on the same slide. Some people are asking, yes. did you move your slide? Okay. Yes. Okay, very good. What, what sort of research we're doing? So, so, so basically by weighting the past, the future, so the past is the integral, the future is the derivative, and the present, which is the state of my node, I can fine tune basically the behavior of my federated learning, of my averaging process, in a way that will allow me uh, to, to better adapt myself to situations where I think that I should learn fast or I should not learn fast because learning fast might induce me into error or whatever. This is one thing. We can also attach to the weighting, and this is something I was working on with my students, uh, a, a weight which is based on the reliability of the source, basically on, on the reputation of the source, the trust that they have in the source. So less trustworthy sources will be weighted less and so on. So the bad news, so this is just to span very quickly federated learning and what we are doing in this and what direction we go and what to try to do. So now, the point of federated learning is that you have bad news is that you don't have a theoretical assurance that the federated learning will converge to the same result of the, as the direct learning. Why? Because the averaging is the averaging of a result of something which is nonlinear. Basically, in your in your in your network, you have a nonlinear operation. So <coughs> averaging is linear and the network operation is nonlinear. So you're breaking basically breaking something into a, a lot of nonlinear operation. It is as if you take a cow, you you break the cow into many steaks and you eat the steaks one by one. And, and you build yourself each time after eating a steak. So uh, you see that uh, there is a nonlinear operation which is happening here where the cutting of the cow is a linear operation. So, um, so the good news is that experiment shows that it works quite well. Basically that you, you seem to converge uh, towards the same model uh, in the same, uh, in the same, uh, okay. So now <clears throat> what I want to do is get rid of the central authority. Basically what I mean by the central authority, <coughs> the, the aggregator. I want everybody to be able to aggregate, everybody to be able to check that the data that they aggregate has been taken into account in the global model. And, uh, and uh, I, I want uh, this learning process to be done without the central authority. So the question is, how can you do this without the central authority? How can you know uh, that things are aggregated? How do you know that they're aggregated without, uh, without actually revealing uh, to someone uh, what you learn? Because remember, what is happening is that everybody is sending to the central authority their model, but not to the peers. 
and the, 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 the authority will send back the aggregated model. So here, if I need to broadcast my model to the peers, I'm releasing a lot of information. So I don't want to release this to the peer. So here is uh, how you can do that. And for the people here who, who are a little bit familiar with crypto, I hope there are some. Uh, I can show you how it is done. So you agree about the prime P and the generator G in some group. And each node, <coughs> each mobile phone is going to, to publish uh, a G uh, to the XI. And we're going to see uh, basically uh, what this XI is. It's just, uh, it just a secret key that, uh, that was chosen by, uh, by the mobile phone and a proof that the phone knows XI. And then the phone is going to compute something they call the GYI, which is basically this funny ratio of products. Uh, on one hand, uh, in, the, in the numerator, uh, a product of the G to the XI of all my peers before uh, my rank, and then of all those after my rank. And I'm going to divide one, uh, one, uh, one, uh, one by the other. And then what is going to happen is that every node is going to publish this quantity, which is G to the XI, YI, times G to the WIJ. And what is WIJ? It is the, 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 the Jth bit of the model WI, of the node of the, of, the, of the weight WI. So basically, everybody is going to give me his first bit of the WI, of the current WI. And then everybody is going to give me the second bit and the third bit and the fourth bit. Okay, so we're going to communicate the bits one by one. Then to find the sum of the bits of the weights at a given point, everybody can do the calculation that I show here. So basically what you're going to do, you're going to do the sum of the G X I Y I to the G uh, W I J, the J bit. And if you look at what this simplifies into, this simplifies into G to the sum of all the bits at the given rank that everybody gave. And, 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 then, and then it is extremely easy now to explore what is this power uh, of uh, W I and why would that work? Why would it work? It works because we have this uh, specific relationship uh, that I was uh, that I'm showing here. If you define x i and y i as we did previously, what you have is that the sum of the product of the x i y i is equal to zero. And why would that be the case? Because by the de by definition, the y i is nothing but the the people before minus the people after. Hence, <clears throat> if you define this delta as the, pro the, the sum of the product x, y, y, i, a little bit of development just shows you that you have zero. So why is this zero crucial? Because you can see that now when I'm doing the sums done by everybody together, all the, all the, the, the voters, basically all the devices, it's when the devices would have voted the, the sum of all that they did becomes zero. And then we expose G to the power of the bit that I want to learn. So having understood that by using a tool, uh, just a cryptographic tool to, to get rid of the central authority, meaning that you can know that your vote has been taken into account. You don't know what are the votes of the others and you know what is the final result. And, uh, and this is something that we can formally prove. We understood now what is federated learning is about, and it would be good to show what are the, the specific security risks that, that are faced by distributed learning. And why I do that? Because I know that many of you belong to many different areas, and it might be good for, for you to, to try to see an overview uh, of what might be applicable in your area. For the cryptographers who are attending, I, I have just uh, shown you uh, how a cryptographic technique can be used uh, to do this, uh, uh, to improve federated learning. Uh, now I'm trying to, to see uh, other threats and other attacks. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, to, to classify the attacks uh, by, by threat sources. So what do you mean by threat sources? We have uh, in the system, uh, either malicious nodes, basically malicious mobile phones uh, that uh, are um, that are uh, that are that are uploading data, 
uh, or a malicious authority uh, or uh, other external adversaries or end users uh, of the final model who are abusing the, the, the final model. And uh, a further refinement consists of combining the first two, basically malicious nodes and a malicious authority uh, in, in an attack where a malicious authority collaborates with malicious nodes. So just give me one second. I want to move because I have a very low reception here. I'll try to see if I can move away. Give me one second. Okay, we hope to get David uh, very soon back. Uh, so for the questions, don't hesitate to write them directly. I'm seeing already one question. We'll ask them when David finishes. Uh, okay, David is back. So yeah, we'll keep the, to the questions when he finishes his oh, talk. We have a question regarding the bad news point. Can one use concentration bounds to explain conversion of the number of samples in both cases? No, we cannot. At least we don't know how to do it. Uh, the, if you're interested in this, uh, you can look into um, into the works uh, uh, of people such as Ido Shamir, I think it's called Ido Shamir, uh, the son of Adi Shamir, who is a professor by his own right, uh, and he's doing models and trying to find, uh, you know, bounds uh, on machine learning uh, algorithms. <clears throat> there are a number of results that we know, but those results are usually not very practical. For instance, to learn something uh, of this sort with uh, this number of queries, you need to have such a communication complexity and so on. Again, the problem here is that your network, uh, your neural network is a nonlinear function and the averaging that you're doing is a linear function. So, <clears throat> so if you want, um, if you want to, to, to model it, uh, you can think about, about, uh, about uh, a function that that you would apply to to 100, let's say, so you have 100 objects, so you're going to apply the function to 100 objects, and then you can apply this function 10 times to collections of 10 objects and average the result. And what you want to do is know how much you can deviate. Now, if your function is highly nonlinear, which is actually what happens with the neural networks, <coughs> it is extremely difficult for you to infer any bound. At least I don't know about any such results. So we classified the attackers, and I'm going to try to uh, overview each of them uh, to see uh, what can we say about it. So first of all, external attackers. So external attackers is a guy sitting in his basement trying to, uh, to learn what is your data and, um, and learn what people are doing in the network. So when you consider external adversaries, that's the easy part. <laughs> Basically, you assume that the authorities and the node are trustworthy and the external adversary want to compromise their learning process by injecting false data or, or learning what they, 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 are, they are trying to learn. And here, the good news is that standard generic confidentiality, integrity, timestamping, anti-reply, availability, and backup measures are going to do the job. Basically, those, those, uh, those, those measures uh, are there to secure a, 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 a transmission channel. And no matter what you are going to do within the, 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 the transmission channel uh, is going to do the job. Uh, we have tools for that. This is very well studied. And, uh, <clears throat> and also you can go into a further degree of refinement by avoiding traffic analysis, uh, for instance, because uh, there are, there, are, there, there are cases where just the fact that someone is doing something, even if you don't know what he's doing, is an important information. Uh, if you need to protect against this, you can also have inactive nodes to generate decoy traffic. We know how to, to deal with, uh, with external adversaries. So here, basically, because federated learning is something that is not uh, a, a security function as such, we can just embed it into an existing tube, and this is the good news. Now, there is something which 
is important to, to, to underline, which is a notion called discreteness. So what is discreteness? Discreteness is a way to, 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 to maintain security even if cryptography fails. So let me explain to you the example. Assume that, that Marwan is now acting as a server on which I'm doing a backup of my files. This means that from time to time, I need to do an R-sync with him and <clears throat> tell him what are the files that I deleted, what are the new files that I have, and update him. The classical way to do that, and this is what R-sync is doing, is to send to Marwan the hashes of all the files of my system. Marwan is going to compare them to all his hashes, see which ones disappeared, erase those that disappeared, see the ones that he doesn't have, and then query the files whose hashes are the ones that he doesn't have, and then update himself. Now you can see that we can do all this under a tunnel, a secure channel, in which we have encryption, signature, and everything, and nobody can do anything uh, uh, to us. But if one day the encryption key is leaked or the signature key is leaked, what is going to happen? Then we are going to have <clears throat> a leakage of information, which is the information that was protected by the key. Basically, the hashes of the files. So someone could identify that, for instance, Merwan has on his uh, uh, computer now a copy of a contract that has been given to someone before because we see the hash. So information leaked. So the question is, how can I achieve a synchronization with Merwan in a way that in case encryption and signature will fail, would leak the minimum possible? And I'm really obliged to give him the hashes. Well, fortunately, there are protocols that achieve the same result, that it leak less in case you expose the interaction between me and Marwan. For instance, for the file exchange system, what we can do, we can hash all the files. I'm just simplifying it. I can multiply uh, all the, the hashes by each other, modulo and prime, and send the result to Marwan. And he's going to do the same thing on his end. And then divide the two. And you can see that all the billions of files that are the same in our two collections are going to vanish from the, from the fraction. And we are going to remain with a fraction where it, on, the, on, the, on the numerator, they're going to be the product of the hashes that I have and that he does not. And on the denominator, the ones that he has and I do not have. And then we can, from there, try to sort them out. So you see that the discreteness, basically the amount of information revealed in case of security failure by that protocol is lower than RSync, which is better to use. Now, in the case of federated learning, we can look at different dialects of federated learning algorithms and try to see which one has the greater discreteness and then opt for that one. At times, greater, greater discreteness is going to come at the cost of more calculations or more transmission. So to finish about the external adversaries with a tunneling uh, of uh, a standard tunneling as we know how to do today, plus a choice of an algorithm with a good discreteness uh, or discretion, depending if it's French or English, uh, this, is, um, this case is settled. Now, uh, <clears throat> now uh, we can look at another, at another risk in, uh, in uh, the list and I'm going to take the fourth one, which is the end users. So what the end user can, can how the end user can misuse federated learning. So I consider that I have K training data sets that together is the global data sets D. And I'm going to train, use the classical model to, 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 to learn D. Now, and I have a second model and this is basically linking to the question that was asked by, uh, by chat. I'm going to federately learn D1 to DK, meaning each time learn a DK, average them and continue. And I'm going to get W tilde. And we know that empirically, we, we are going to get models that are, that are usually alike. However, a slight difference between the two models can be exploited to create different or additional adversarial examples in between the two models because it might be the case that attacks that you have on W would not be operating on W tilde and the other way around. So this risk 
today has not been investigated in the literature. If you really want to have an interesting uh, research paper, you can try to take adversarial examples um, on a, a, a learning algorithm and see what happens when the learning uh, is done in a federated way. It should open you the door to, 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 to new uh, adversarial examples uh, that uh, are, are, are not applicable to, to, to the first model with a very high probability. Uh, this is something that we tried, and indeed we found cases where we have at least the case of a, 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 an example which is caught uh, by W, but not caught but by W tilde on synthetic data. So it would be nice to, to try to see what is the impact of federated learning on adversarial examples. Just to quote uh, uh, one of the risks. Now, <clears throat> a node <clears throat> can become malicious in two ways. Either it can feed uh, either you can take a, a node, a node which is honest, and feed it with fake data. This is one possibility that you have. Another one is you can modify the node's legitimate behavior. Uh, so the cryptographers have a very, very strange uh, uh, ways to 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 call this, uh, which is the powerful adversary, the semi-honest model, and so on. I will pass on that. Uh, none of them are really very much linked uh, to, 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 to reality because if the attacker can do something, he shoots to kill. But, but this is, these are notions that are highly specialized. And attacks may combine both also, modify a node and feed it with fake data, meaning uh, do, do both. And when I try to see where I can go here, I, 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 I found this, this node-based risk tax, tax, taxonomy which can either prevent the normal learning, which you can do by injecting fake data or omitting real data. You can slow down the learning process, which means it will succeed, but the convergence will be slower. It can be an attack. For instance, someone wants to learn how to, uh, to do financial operations. And I know that he, if he learns fast enough, <coughs> uh, I will have a financial loss. So I'm slowing down his learning. Or, you, a, a node can try to compromise a fellow node privacy, basically learn information about the fellow node inputs or learn even the number of fellow node inputs, meaning how many inputs someone had, okay? Which meant allow you to know if a shop which is nearby has having a lot of clients or not. So these are typical risks that a security analysis uh, should encompass. And then you need to rule them out or say, yes, no, I protect against them, I'm doing this. So <clears throat> the, the other source of threats that you can have on, on, on federated learning is the malicious authority. So we showed that we can dispense with the authority, with the cryptographic construction I showed you before. But you assume uh, that uh, being the model's owner, uh, the, the authority has no interest to pervert the model or prevent its construction. Uh, however, the risk here is that the authority will want to learn uh, data that the nodes do not want or, or, or should not be releasing to it. So this is yet another risk uh, that, that I classified on this. And when I try to, de to see how the galaxy looks, uh, this is the, uh, the, the diagram that I came out with. So you have the federated learning threats that divide into four types of threats, end user threats, authority threats, external threats, and, and uh, node threats. You can see that with the external ones, which are the easier one, have availability, confidentiality, integrity, and all the others that I don't show. The, the end user threats is extra adversarial uh, exemplars that you, can, that you can create. Authority is compromising node privacy. And then you have node threats that are divided into two categories, either preventing the normal operation or learning what is happening or slowing down. So you can see that by thinking about a, a primitive like this, you can try to see what tools you can fit uh, in order to solve it and to make it, um, to, make it uh, to make it more robust. So having defined the threats, now we need to define the attacker's capability. So as I told you, the cryptographers distinguish usually two types of attackers, what they call the semi-honest and the malicious. So both of them are, are sort of strange because um, if you are an attacker, then you're not honest. So why can you be semi-honest? And a malicious attacker is also a very strange term because if you are attacking, it means that you are malicious. 
So I don't see a gentle attacker rather than malicious attacker. It's, it doesn't make sense. Nonetheless, these are the standard terms that cryptographers use, and it makes them a lot of pleasure to reason with it. Uh, so how do they define it? So the semi-honest attacker is one who does not de deviate from the protocol specification. So he's a, an attacker with ethics. He said, the rule is this, I'm going to use this. So basically, you are in Dubai. Uh, you, you have the, the, the regulations and the rules of the police and circulation. You are not going to uh, de deviate from the specifications, but, but you're trying to achieve an adversarial goal by not deviating from, you don't want to commit any crime, but still uh, you want to, to, uh, to arrive to your end. And we also call them passive attackers. Why passive? Because they don't corrupt the law. They don't, they don't transgress the law. They just abide by the law, but still they want to arrive to a place that they shouldn't be. So for instance, you are, you, you are respecting the, all the traffic regulations and all the restrictions of circulation in Dubai, but still you find yourself with your car uh, in the parking of the government, which should not be something author uh, authorized. You did it in a passive way, but not breaking any rule. You just follow the rule and you found a loophole that allowed you to, to, to park your car in the, in the parking of the parliament. This is the passive attacker. Now, the malicious attacker, he may arbitrarily deviate from the public specification. He may correct people, he can threaten them, he can shoot at them, he can, he can overspeed, he can do anything he wants. We call them the active attackers. And this is a strong security model because if you resist to malicious attackers, it means that your system is much more robust. Just to simplify. Now, can uh, crypto, for instance, help? For end user threats, not much. Why? Because this is a pure AI problem. From external threats, we saw that uh, standard protections, as I showed, uh, are, are, are actually going to solve the problem. So what we need to, to focus now is on authority threats and node threats and see uh, what, what, uh, what sort of, of protections uh, we get from the literature. So if you look, for instance, at the authority which is attacking nodes, which is a passive attack, the authority wish to learn information about the, the data of the nodes, and it doesn't violate the protocol because the protocol is very simple. It's basically, I send you, you send me, I send you, you send. So one option is to use what we call mixed networks. So what is a mixed network? A mixed network, as you can see, you have a, a, an information A here. I'm going to encrypt it with a key and then send it to someone who is going to decrypt, re-encrypt, decrypt, re-encrypt, decrypt, re-encrypt, and each time we'll mix them randomly and we forward them to the next node. So this means that if I want to know at the exit where A came from, I need to compromise all those mixed networks. This is called mixed networks. And you can use this to avoid that the authority learns which model comes from who, okay? By mixing, shuffling between uh, the different nodes. This is a standard tool that can certainly uh, bring you some robustness uh, with respect to a malicious attack. Another option that you can use is what we call the one-time pad, which is basically masking. So you have two nodes that exchange a Diffie-Hellman key. Uh, they, they do a key exchange. And then one is adding to his model this key and the other subtracting from his model that key. Now you're going to say, what if it become negative? Okay, you do this modulo some, uh, some number, modulo, modulo some, 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 some prime or modulo some power of two, no matter. You either add or, or, or subtract. So I'm going to, so I'm, I, I have my mobile phone and my one has his mobile phone. The two mobile phone will generate a key Marwan will add uh, the key, I will subtract the key, and then we're going to give this to the authority. And the authority is going to retrieve the, <coughs> the sum of the two, and hence we would have masked our data. We didn't mask the sum of our data, but we masked our individual data. So if we do this protocol again and again and again, and each time we establish keys with someone else and we add K, we subtract k, we add k, we subtract k. You see that if you let nodes do that sufficiently many times, uh, what you're going to have is your wa plus k1 minus k2 plus k3 minus k4 minus k5 plus k6, and the sum of those k is eventually going to vanish. So nodes <coughs> are not learning the peer data, but the node and the authority would learn if they cooperate. So we reduce the risk. And um, 
And the question is, what happens if a node is suddenly down? If a node is suddenly down, it is uh, a problem because uh, you see that we have a correcting factor <clears throat> that remains in the sum, and then it poisons the entire averaging. So it is so node should not go down. Now, what happens if the node goes down anyway and goes down anyway? Well, this is a bit technical. We're going to use secret sharing to ascertain that the corresponding UI can be retrieved from others. Basically, for those of you who are familiar with red, red disks, you know that in a red disk, you have three disks, one containing a data A, the other containing a data B, and the third containing A or B. Now you see that if any of the, the three disks failed, you can still replace it. If you have one, one failing out of three, you can, still, uh, you can still replace it. Because if A doesn't exist anymore, you take A or B, you XOR it with B, you get A and you can replace the disk. Same for B. And of course, if the XOR disk died, then you XOR A and B and you get it. So basically this redundancy system allows you to, to deal with a disk who actually died. As you can see, this system is when you have three disks. Here, what I showed you is you have two disks, basically. You have UA and UB. <clears throat> so, so if you want to, to, to be resilient uh, against uh, those failures, what you would do is you would use secret sharing with a third disk or a third user. And then even if one user goes silent, you can still uh, uh, retrieve uh, the information and do the averaging. And you can do it with with if you want to, to protect against seven uh, users going uh, silent or 11 or 100. Uh, it is a standard technique, which is called uh, secret sharing. So masking plus secret sharing has been uh, proposed by Google and uh, others uh, in a number of papers. If you're interested, you can have a look. I, I, co I quote it here. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the interesting thing is to try to see uh, if the authority can, can mount an active attack. So now we have an authority who is totally uh, insane, doing whatever it wants. And uh, given that it has an active role to broadcast each time a new W, the active uh, attack consists in broadcasting a fake W to a specific node. So basically, everybody, so assume that, that we have uh, a, a, an agency uh, wanting to attack someone, an intelligence agency wanting to attack someone. So what we can do is, is basically <clears throat> send a fake W only to that user who will continue to learn with that fake W and who's going to refine it. And, uh, and, and, and then because I'm driving the model of that user into a very specific W wrong, a wrong W, I can start to retrieve private data about the person. So basically, I can, I can deviate what he does because he continues basically to learn from a, a, from a, from a given, from given point and I can control that point. So the, the solution would be that nodes must check the, 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 the data that they get is the same. Basically that <clears throat> we all get the same uh, new W and this is, can be done with a, with a tool which is called multi-signature, which is basically everybody is signing every node, every mobile phone is going to sign, yes, I got this from the authority. Basically, the authority is going to broadcast something, the model to me. I cannot, <clears> that <throat> this model is confidential because the authority doesn't want to reveal it to anybody else than the nodes, not to the attacker. So what the nodes would do is that once they got the new model, they will multi-sign it and each of them will check that everybody in the community actually got the same model as him. And then the authority can either poison everybody at once uh, or, or do nothing because uh, if they poison one, this one will see that he's not getting the same information as the others. Why not betraying what the information was, okay? You, they are supposed to know the message so you can uh, send them the, <coughs> the signature. Now, uh, if nodes are just few, you don't need to use a multi-signature. You can use actually a regular signature. So here you see what we're doing. Basically, everybody signs the, so the authority sign, sends uh, its data to the three first and one and two and three. And then uh, I actually did the, the, 
the diagram the other way around because in Arabic, you know, we write on the other side. So it starts with the authority on the right and then goes to N1, N2, and 3 And then after this, N1, N2, and 3 uh, mixed. So you read it in the Arabic way. So the authority transmitting the data to N1, N2, and 3 N1 is signing the data for N2 and N3, N2 is signing for N1 and N3, N3 is signing for N1 and N2, and then everybody saw a signature. This is if you don't have uh, that many, uh, that many, uh, that many uh, participants. Okay, <clears throat> what if the authority just trashes WK instead of taking it into account? Basically, uh, the, the authority is only going to take your WK and put it in the trash and not take into account what you learn. Okay, there are uh, actually ways uh, to, to, to protect against this. So basically what you're going to do is here you have uh, a sort of, of, of very simple way uh, to, to get around it. So what you're going to do, you're going to choose a very big random, I call it QI, and you're going to just concatenate QI to your uh, WI. But you see that you leave, QI is a 160-bit uh, least significant uh, digit. I'm going to leave 10 extra bits with zero, which are for the carry that operation that I'm going to do. And then I'm putting my WI at the front. Now, the authority is going to publish the sum of those WIs. So what is going to do, happen when you're going to do the sum of those WIs? All the QIs are going together and jump because they are the least significant bits. Some carry from the addition of the QI is going to fall into the 10 extra bit that I padded. And the authority is going to publish this collection of data, which is G to the power of the W bar Is. Now, if you look into what is happening here, each node can check based that, that if you even forget the, the module, what is happening here is that the G to the power of W bar I gives him a TI and that this TI is something that he knows how to, to predict because it was broadcast by the authority. So basically the authority is going to encrypt my W bar I and send it to me. And I'm going to check this, that, that, that my one was taken into account. Now, <clears throat> what else am I going to, to check? That when I subtract from the global product of the TIs, my uh, W bar I, then I get back on my feet. Basically, that I was taken into account in the global, uh, in the global sum, in the global sum that was done. And if so, we can infer W, which is simply W bar modulo two to the 170. So this allows you basically to, to ascertain that your input was taken into account without revealing what your input was. Okay, uh, now we can turn into node threads briefly <clears throat> because I think that I'm running a little bit out of time. How much time do I have still? 10 minutes? Yeah, less than 10 minutes. Less. But I mean, take 10 minutes, it's fine. Okay, <clears throat> it's, it's a bit less. So uh, then we have uh, the risk of injection fake data. Uh, so it's hard to ascertain by crypto that data is genuine, but crypto can check the data is not duplicated in the passive model. So you can use Bloom filters in adversarial environment. You can use quotient hash tables, things that allow you to know that the same data didn't arrive to the node twice. And here we have uh, we have in, in, in an adversarial setting, okay? Because if you took a Bloom filter and you know how the Bloom filter works and I'm in an adversarial setting, I'm not in, an, in, in a natural setting of data being recent and, and so on. I, I know how you, you manage your Bloom filter and, <clears throat> and using the, the knowledge I have on the way you manage your Bloom filter, I can mislead you. So we have cryptographic Bloom filters. Basically uh, people like Monina uh, uh, and, 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 and others, study this, basically you replace the hash functions by max, and then you cannot know what information the filter is keeping and then you cannot mislead it using adversarial strategies. So <clears throat> you can check, for instance, crypto gives you this. It's already interesting to take, uh, already interesting to take. 
if you take it, the other uh, risk that I that I listed, which is uh, <clears throat> which is omitting true data. Uh, so here, uh, omitting true data, unlike the authority active scenario, here data is not integers but raw data. For instance, images, voice, uh, uh, movies, and so on. So we do not find a way in which crypto can can help you in the case you omit true data. Uh, if you slow down uh, the, the, the learning, if this is risk entry that I was talking about, it calls for an incidental question, how would you want to slow down? And <clears throat> you can do it in several ways. You can either do it by delaying transmission of data or injecting fake data or transmitting or omitting true data. And here we go back to, to, this, uh, to these two threats, which are N1 and N2. Uh, with the same problem that I, that I, that I told you before. Uh, in the case of N1, uh, we have uh, the injecting of fake data. Crypto cannot help you much, but you can know that data has not been duplicated. In two, uh, I, I don't see how crypto could help you. So on those two moments, you have to, to apply other measures. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, if we uh, look into the node threats, we look into the, the node privacy, uh, we, and we are nearly near the end of the presentation. Uh, here we have nodes learning information about fellow nodes input or learning how many inputs they have. This you can address using something called homomorphic encryption. So homomorphic encryption is an encryption technique that allows you to deal with the plain text without decrypting the cipher text. So I'm not talking about the very heavy fully homomorphic encryption that people are always talking about now but on a partially homomorphic and very fast uh, encryption method, which is called the Payet crypto system, where you have this relationship. Basically, if you take the ciphertext of X and Y, you multiply them and you decrypt this, uh, and, you and you decrypt this, what you're going to get, you're going to get X plus Y. Basically, the decryption of the product of encryption is going to give you the sum. And, <clears throat> The consequence of this is that the decryption of an encryption to the power y gives you x to the y. Now, if you recall, what are the, 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 the operations that we're interested in? Basically, summation here. And here you can see that it is a multiplication by a given, uh, by a given, uh, by a given factor. Okay? Uh, here I have a mistake, actually. It's not x to the y. It is x times y. Sorry, this is x times y here. The decryption of the encryption, the y is x times y, sorry. And, and here what you see is that we can absolutely uh, compute uh, this with encrypted data. Basically for the sum, you do the product of the encryption of the fi's and to multiply by nk, you just raise it to the power of nk. Okay, and then you get nk once you decrypt, this the decryption of this formula is going to give you exactly what you need. So this was <clears throat> actually published by uh, all those people from Japan. And uh, it is also, this also addressing the, the learning the, the, the number of uh, fellow inputs uh, thanks to, to the encryption. So in conclusion, I, this is going to be my last slide. Protect, federated learning is, is, is to be protected as a security engineering problem. You can see how we, we deal with it, we take the, 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 the function, we try to think what it does, what can be the threats, how we can, uh, how we can protect it step by step, try to understand the underlying problem, define the capabilities of the adversary, define the goal of the adversary, formalize the threats, and then mitigate the threats. And we can see that <clears throat> crypto helps us to mitigate some of the main threats that are that are faced by federated learning and that this mitigation comes at a computational cost which is totally reasonable so the conclusion of this is touching a little bit upon how we work uh, when we do security research we take a phenomenon that nothing to do with security uh, and we try to imagine how uh, this can be breached how can damage be done and then we apply tools. And this is one of the tools that I was applying here is crypto, but we can apply many other tools that we are, that we are using uh, regarding formal proof, uh, regarding uh, all, sorts, all sorts of other techniques in, in computer science uh, to try to, to, uh, to block those goals. And, uh, and the most interesting things that we find are 
when you find adversarial scenarios that are, have not been thought about, basically new ways to do harm. I'll give you an example. Uh, recently, I was uh, analyzing with uh, some of my students a, <coughs> a way, uh, a scheme that a, a, a telecom operator proposed to propose to students free GSM subscription. So the idea is that the, 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 the student doesn't pay his subscription, but when he talks, uh, be it on WhatsApp or, or Signal or whatever, is interrupted from time to time by an advertisement that he has to listen to for a few seconds. And that's it. So if you are a student, you don't have a lot of money and each 10 seconds you agree to be interrupted for five minutes advertisement, that's fine and they pay your subscription. Now, very quickly, we came up with an application that lodges two parallel calls and switches between them when the advertisement appears to avoid the advertisements. Not only you don't pay the subscription, you occupy double bandwidth and the operator has to pay for it. So this typical threat is a threat that you don't find in books. Basically, <clears throat> you're not going to, to find uh, any security engineering book telling you, you have to be careful about people switching between calls if they do this, if they do that. You don't find this. So the question is, uh, uh, how can you generate those things uh, out of nothing? Basically, it's out of dialogue between disciplines. And uh, this, I hope, is going to be the result of the interaction that we're going to have uh, with the audience, uh, given your questions and interests. So oh, thank you, David. Very interesting and uh, many research <laughs> directions that you have been pointing out uh, in, the, in the convergence, or let's say in, in, uh, in the two ways to approach the problem of federated learning with, and, and crypto. So, okay, we'll go to the question. So there's Renato, let's start with Renato. He had to go out. So maybe you can read the question and, and see if you can answer it. Yes, I have to leave now, uh, but I just, just to follow out on the question about concentration bounds, I don't know if it has been looked into already, but an estimator like median of means is commonly used in place of empirical average <coughs> for being more robust against outlier. You can try to do the median of means. Uh, the question is, does, is it going to reflect something which is interesting given the specific real life data that you are studying? I don't know, it has to be experimented. It has to be experimented. Okay. So the question from Ayub uh, asking, how do you think edge computing might help mitigate the computation communication costs related to federated learning, especially in 6G environment? Wow. Well, <laughs> um, I think that today uh, with federated learning, the, the the, the bottleneck is not that much computation. When you look, because it is spread over a lot uh, of devices, um, we don't have really a, a, uh, a, big, a, big, a big problem in terms of computation. Uh, people try to see uh, how precise uh, the learned model is. The, the battle is there. There's even been a competition there recently with uh, cancer data in federated learning to see which one has the best model. Uh, <clears throat> so this is, this is one, one, uh, one direction, not that much linked to 6G. Uh, it's, it depends really on the algorithms that you are using. Uh, maybe if you have the capacity to communicate more data, you can think about hybrid uh, things that are, I learn part, I transmit part of the data, and hence I don't have to do many iterations locally. So if the 6G allows me a very big bandwidth, what I may do is that I can sort out the data that I have, send uh, the data which is not very informative or not previously uh, compromised to the central authority and let the central authority uh, deal with that one and learn, add it to refinement and locally treat uh, what is sensitive. Uh, <clears throat> you can also think about about uh, models where I would send the bulk of the data uh, plus uh, some noise uh, that I would add to the data. And because I have a very big bandwidth, these nodes which will cancel, noise will cancel out uh, the learning step. Uh, although here, nonlinearity can also be a problem. So there are many directions in which you can think. Uh, each of them would be worthy of a, of a good paper, you know, if you have time to. to to implement and play with this. Uh, this typically the sort of things that, that, that you would do. Um, 
this would be my comment on, on 6D and Edge. <coughs> so do we have other questions? Yes. There's one other question. Yes, Xiao Xie. Considering uh, many nodes uh, in federated learning, how to achieve scalable and robust system? Any suggestion, also any preference across tool, federated learning and difference privacy, lightweight fully homomorphic encryption or MPC. Okay, lightweight fully homomorphic encryption has to still be invented uh, <clears throat> because uh, today uh, usually uh, fully homomorphic encryption is, is something that that eats from much a lot of resources. Uh, so yeah, you can use all sorts of tools like this. Uh, it depends also, uh, well, scalability depends what you mean by scalability. Is it the fact of adding more nodes or removing nodes? That's not that much of an issue because you can, you can start learning with a few uh, nodes and then add nodes or remove nodes. As long as you take it into account when you're averaging, that's okay. Robustness, <coughs> robustness. Uh, well, we saw what may happen if you have uh, nodes that try to misbehave. And we have the analysis that we have done now and you can see the sort of tools that we are using for it. Uh, we talked about things like differential privacy which, without saying its name, basically when you add a one-time pad and I subtract the one-time pad, or if we add a noise which is not synchronized between both of us, but which on the average would, would uh, vanish. Um, <clears throat> we achieve an, an amount of protection. Uh, fully homomorphic encryption is something that everybody tries to use everywhere. Uh, so I would not be astonished that we can do interesting things with it by actually doing the whole learning process uh, uh, without decrypting the data. However, this would more be suitable not to federated learning. Basically, I'm going to transmit the encrypted data to the, um, the central authority without telling the central authority what the, 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 the encrypted data is, and still they can learn with it. MPC is sort of more heavy, and you really need to know what sort of MPC, for those who know, is multi-party computation. Uh, <clears throat> what exactly functions we want to evaluate on the data need to be, to be looked at. Need to be looked at. Any more questions? Okay, I think we're we're on time, uh, David. I think thank you again for your talk. Of course, I have thank many you. questions related to privacy, uh, how you can hack the models in federated learning when you have a distributed framework. But we could spend hours on that. Uh, uh, we're not going going in all those details. Again, I'd like to thank you for your time. And I will look forward, uh, and TIA look forward also to look to 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 work with you.